The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. So I want to give you a perspective into the Middle East, not the hype perspective, a true perspective. Also, I want to give you a situational update about Iran and Russia, Syria, Israel, Gaza, Palestine, Lebanon. There's been a meeting, and that began late last night, into this morning, all the way up into this very moment. Putin has been, he has taken up a leadership role with nations in the Middle East. But before I discuss that, guys, I want you guys to be very careful. See, when someone cares about you, and they know what you're about to face, you may not know it, but they know. Wouldn't that person plead with you to consider what your rhetoric is about? Wouldn't that person remind you of the standards of a kingdom that you're of, and the penalty that all men will face who choose the path of violence? Is this to condone what Hamas has done? No, they, that is the problem. Think about it. Hamas, do you guys know about the whole situation? See, I never like talking about half a situation. I like to talk about the whole situation. I like to speak about everything. Not have one piece and run with it. And then advocate for that one piece. But to see the entire picture. So that you can meditate upon that and pray for very real things. If you only see half of a picture, you're going to pray for that half. Missing the other half. If you do that, you're not praying in truth. You're going to make a request based on one-sidedness, which is not in the realm of righteousness, is it? Because righteousness encompasses everything. Think about your Father in heaven. Think about the Lord Jesus. What was his decree concerning Satan who betrayed the entirety of the Godhead, the entirety of the kingdom of God? What did God do with Satan? He is the criminal of criminals, is he not? Yes, he is. What did God do with him? Did Satan face instant destruction? No, he didn't. He still operates to this very day. Him and the one-third who followed him. Now that's our father. He allowed darkness to continue. He did. Why did he do that? Why does he allow darkness to continue? Why do people yet still contend with demons? Because Satan is your adversary. Make no mistake, he's right here on this earth, isn't he? The one-third that followed him is right here on this earth. He goes to and fro to the heavens to accuse you, that is, until Christ came. God did not destroy him, and he still maintained lots of his power. Why did God do that? Because God knows exactly what he's doing. Because this is God's creation, not ours. Because we have a father, and we ourselves are not the father. See, somehow that's been lost in translation, that somehow the children know better than the father. No, we don't. We are to learn of the Father, to learn of His will, to learn of His ways, that we may become more like Him. But for some reason, what spirit is roaming in the earth, causing people to believe that they know more than the living God? Can anybody answer that? Because isn't that what's happening? When people interpret so many things that they, they want their will from, and they disregard the will of God not even considering all of the will of God. We have to be careful to stop putting words in God's mouth, but to become true family of the living God, true children. Learn of his ways, employ those ways, walk in those ways, conduct ourselves accordingly as we have chose, because no one has forced anybody to become part of God's family through Christ. No one is being forced to do that. That's something a person chooses, or they do not. We have to be careful, watchful, sober. We also have to be mindful. When you listen to the views of men too much, you embed yourself in a kingdom of chaos that's already established on this earth. Losing your placement in righteousness is where the mood swings come from, the tainting comes from. There is no ill will in the kingdom of God. And if you're walking around with an attitude, then you've been touched by the wrong thing, simply put. Don't you think? Did not everybody in the Bible find this out? God reminded them what they were doing. And every single person that was in one of these bad moods, who had a violent nature, in that moment they were serving the wrong side. They were serving darkness and not light. When they thought they had to fight to crush their enemy outside of God's decree, they didn't really understand. And when God sent them to go and dispatch certain people in the earth. They still misunderstood that. God defined it 
but they somehow missed it, judging the living God as though he didn't know what he was doing. Should we remain that way as know-it-alls or children of the Most High? Why do you think people are powerless in this day and age? Yes, they are powerless. Many people exercise no authorities of the kingdom of God because they reject the king of the kingdom of God. Every time they walk in the wilds of this world in a darkness and a shadow of something that is highly corrupt, they stand devoid of authority, exercising none. God doesn't want you to walk in this earth without authority. How can any of us carry the gospel without authorities of the kingdom? That's important. It's important that healing be in your hands. It's important that authority be in your voice. You're not to be some victim in the world, having these extenuating trials that you go through all your life. No, you're not to have that. You're to walk in a victory. But in order to do that, you must fully agree with Christ. I'll tell you right now, Christ does not agree with the leaders of this earth. Hope you know that. He does not. Because if he did, every plan they had would be prosperous, and all the fruit of those plans would be full of righteousness. But we know they're not, and we know the principle in the Bible is that you'll know a tree by its fruit. That means you'll not know what something is any other way than by its fruit. And we know that the fruit of this world, of these kingdoms, of these leaders, has been nothing short of death and destruction on a continuous basis. You have to consider the whole thing. The world will try to convince you to take sides. But I say you've already taken a side. You've taken sides with the Messiah, with righteousness, with the kingdom of the living God. You've come out of this world, but the world is trying to get you to enter back into it, and it will utilize anything it can to cause you to participate in the violence now being exercised all throughout the world. This is not only for the Middle East. This is everywhere. Every abomination no, it's being practiced right now, but people have a great blindness and they can't see it. My hope is that you will see it, that you'll realize it, stand up, be in power that is blessed from the Most High. That your voice be a voice of authority wherever you are. That you stand in the place of an overcomer, no longer sitting in the shadow being a victim. That you advocate for the kingdom of your Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, and that kingdom is the kingdom of God, not this world. The Bible clearly states, you're in this world, but you are not of this world. And if you're not of this world, then surely the kingdom that you have a strong desire to serve is beyond the reach of all things in this world, which puts you at a higher standard than what the world has. You see, only you can agree to lower your own standards. Only you can. Satan will constantly give an excuse, a message. He will always try to recruit you to enter into the kingdoms of this world and to reject the kingdom of the living God. That's something you have to choose every single day. In the Bible it says, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. It did not say, choose for the year whom you're going to serve. No, that's something you have to do every single day of your life. Serving the Lord is something you have to choose to do every single day of your life. And when I say serving the Lord, I'm not talking about bringing milk and cookies to everybody. No. To serve the Lord is to be an ambassador to righteousness, to his gospel. The hard things that the world is not going to do It's always going to be hard to the world. And it's always going to be hard so long as you have the mindset of the world. Once you have a kingdom mindset, it, nothing is hard to do. Everything becomes your way of life. It's only hard to do because it's against the ways of the world. But we'll establish that in conversation. And you do realize, because of the children, the penalties are coming. Because of the children. So I want you guys to see, when Christians, that is to say believers of Christ, when they vanish, when they're absent from duty, when they're not standing in their lot, generations suffer. And I want you guys to understand and finally realize the sentiment of the children. Not the sentiment of the children in a specific place, but the sentiment of children all around the world. You will not believe it. Listen, you cannot see prophecy from one country. You have to know the whole world to see prophecy. You cannot see prophecy from your own personal perspective. You have to know the truth to understand prophecy. Having an opinion and listening to those who agree with you only is not seeing everything. 
There are lots of things you will not agree with, but they are still in the realm of truth. You don't agree with them because of your heritage, because of your environment, because of how you're brought up and what country you reside in. Nevertheless, these are happenings that are taking place around the globe, and only by knowing it, the true state of this world, can you see what sees in your eye. If a person were blind and they could not hear nor had help, how can they tell when the seasons are changing? If they cannot analyze their environment directly, if they can feel no temperatures, if they cannot see the trees, if they cannot hear the animals, if they can't feel the temperatures changing, they can't tell what season they're in. And if they just analyze just one part, you still can't tell. In midsummer, trees turned. If a person could only see the trees turning, and they couldn't feel the temperatures, nor they knew nothing about the animals, they would get the seasons wrong. If a person could just see the animals, and they couldn't see the trees, and they couldn't tell the temperature, they would get the seasons wrong. If they could just tell the temperature, and they couldn't see the trees nor the animals, they would get the season wrong. You must be able to see it all to identify the season. Everybody before you who said the world would have ended back in their time, they were wrong because they refused to see everything. They only looked at what they wanted to see, and they refused to see everything. Now is not the time to refuse to see the truth of the state of this world. And in order to see the truth of the state of this world, you have to see everything, not one thing, everything. Not see through one person's eyes, but to see it all in truth. Because once you see it in truth, you will not take man's side. You will already be on the side of Christ. You'll have a heart to intercede, not a heart to point fingers and blame. You'll see the struggle of children who will mourn at the loss of the volume of children. You'll rebuke the pride and the arrogance and ego of the pious, of those who call themselves a ruling class. Then you'll know the season you're in. But until that time, it's almost impossible to tell what season you're in. So we're going to open that up tonight. My hope is that none of you choose a side among men that's already condemned. Okay, everybody. It's no secret. We have a mess. We have a big mess. And it's about to get a whole lot worse. As of late, you guys have noticed that people cannot reach solutions. America is a prime example of that. We have been in a political war inside of America for two years now. Many experts within America suspect the civil war is on the horizon. Are you guys aware of that? Because the tension between the two parties is much higher than you think. In fact, there have been, there's been a great fracture in the agencies. You may not know this, but there are people that are collecting names, locations. They want to find out of the populace who is who, and they will act accordingly when their plans go into action. Now we're talking about America. America is going to have a deep fracture from the inside. Based on your conversations, based on anybody's rhetoric, lots of social media, they have a good idea of who is who. When it starts to break down, many people are going to be involved because of a lack of discipline of themselves. Combat, or to make this worse in the country of America, communications are going to be opened up in such a way that everybody will be able to see everybody's messages. So those who engaged in gossip, everything they gossiped about will be out. And you know, as the principle in the Bible that everything done in secret is going to be brought to the forefront. Everybody's going to know who everybody is. About 13 years ago, I warned about this. And on occasion, I give that warning. But now it's starting to happen. And nothing can stop it. Because people have been out there too long. People have been highly opinionated. Join in the conversations they shouldn't have. This is something that people do, and it will involve everybody, and nobody is safe from it. A long time ago, I told you guys that a program, something would happen, and everybody who talked about anybody is going to receive the message from the person they talked about. And that will tear down a lot of relationships. Now, that was before all of you knew about AI. Isn't that ironic? This was a long time ago. Now that AI is launched on many different levels, it has started certain breaches, or let's just say data exchanges, have mapped out everybody who communicates that will be utilized. 
who people discuss and what they talk about, that's also been mapped out. And pretty soon, anybody you had a conversation about will get to that person. Now, that's going to cause some big problems in this country. Why? Because people are paranoid. And I was hoping back then that people would listen, that they would understand that uh, that was not a joke. In small sectors of the U.S. is happening, and murder has been the result of it. Violence has been a result of it. People are being betrayed left and right. People are already at the point of breaking. They're skeptical. They don't trust each other. That's only going to solidify massive amounts of division amid high tensions among people already. Already. But I did warn. See, the truth is, had we stayed with biblical principle, all of you would have been exempt. But we have gotten such habits of gossip, haven't we? You know what gossip does? First of all, the Lord hates it. Do you guys know that? The Lord does not like a tail bearer. He does not like a person who runs into trouble. He doesn't like that either. That's what YouTube has become. For the most part, that's what TikTok is. It's got everybody talking about somebody else. Just think about that. Becoming highly opinionated against someone. That's exactly what Satan does. It's exactly what he does. Now, let me ask you guys something. Before I go any further, is it important for the child of the house to know a storm is coming or is it important for the parent of the house to know that the storm is coming if a child is two years old they'll have no comprehension of the storm therefore it's important that the parent know that difference why because it is we'll assume that the parent of the house has the authority of that house correct they can actually drive the car make changes do this that or the other the child cannot The child can't comprehend or process that information. So maturity plays a part in this. So the one who is the most mature, the one who can actually make those command decisions, it's important that that person know about the storm. And it's their responsibility to be informed about the storm, that they may protect children of the household. See how that works in the world. You're of the kingdom of the living God. You know about seasons the world does not know, and they won't read about, and they won't look into. You know about prophecy, and they don't. You can see the violence building in the world. They see it as a simple civil change. You can see iniquity rising, darkness rising. You can see it rise, as is being expressed. This natural hate for Israel exuding from the flesh of people, because that does not come spiritually. That comes from the flesh. And it comes from having a position. In this case, when the people of the world see these happenings, they get violent, just like a child would. A child may look outside their house and misinterpret what they see. So long as a parent of that house knows what's happening, the child has a cover. But if the parent of the house is lost in the sauce and they don't know the storm that's outside, everybody in the household is in danger. If a teenager in a house knows of a storm, but the parents don't know of a storm, that household could be in danger. Let me give you some innate characteristics of something that's happening right now, something you need to be aware of. Because you're Christians, and you are the ones appointed over the land you're in. You're appointed over the house you're in. No one's appointed over you in a spiritual respect. You are appointed over it, but if you don't act in that capacity, that whole household's in trouble. You were not made to have this be your paradise. You're sent here. To establish a standard. To carry the gospel. You're sent here for the task. You're not sent here like it's an amusement park. That you'll have fun all your life and this and the other. That's not why you're here. You're here because a storm has always been on the way. And the normal people here, the people absent in the spirit, have no ability to see that storm. You do. You're the one in constant thought of what's happening in the world. How close is the storm? You're the one watching, not them. God gave the express task of watching to you all. He didn't give it to the world. The world's not going to watch. They're not even going to read his word. He gave that to you, and you're watching for their sakes. In this day and age, a lot of Christians will say of the world, well, they just won't listen. They're blind. Well, that's why they call them the world. They're supposed to be that way. You're not supposed to be that way. Nor are you to give in because they're blind. There's a passage in the Bible that says, the love of many is going to wax colder and colder because iniquity abounds. And what that is, you guys, you guys will say to yourselves, what's the use? Everybody's doing all this stuff. And here I am trying to keep a standard. And yet I'm the one suffering. And they're not. 
I may as well be like them. You may not realize that you become part of prophecy when you throw in the towel. As you are walking, the Lord's going to stir your spirit if you belong to him. He stirs your spirit so you can find no complacency. He already laid that out in the word of God. Because most people are trying to find peace in their homes. They get the right curtains, get the right paint, get the right couch, get the right color thing, and then they can have peace. Is that not a thought in their heads? Or oh, if I can just get this right thing, I'm going to have peace. The Lord says, no, Jesus is your place of rest. There is no other place of rest for those who belong to Christ, for those who have accepted him. There's no other place of rest. And he made it that way on purpose because if you were to find a paradise here on this earth, that's where you would stay. Truth be told, that's what you tried. You tried to find a paradise here on this earth. You tried to make this earth your paradise. And when you did that, you began to reject certain passages in scripture. If you didn't want to hear them, you wanted to hear the peaceful things, not the whole story. And in so doing, you never developed spiritual authority. And as a consequence of that, you found yourself in more than one situation powerless against the calamities that came to you. And they came to you first before anybody else. Because it's important that you see the outcome of having no spiritual authority. Before the Lord, before he permits the spiritual opposition to the righteous to be released from the bowels of the earth and other places, you have to be in position. What's happening in Israel? Do you think that's normal? Is this just another Hamas attack? Of course it's not. Why not? Because everybody has advanced since the last one. That's why we're sending war machines and everything else over there because something is different. But your life is different too. Do you not know in the past year the Lord has not let any of you relax? Anybody feel that? He's not let you relax on purpose. See, because you're trying to go to sleep. You're trying to find the snooze button on the alarm. But the alarm won't shut off. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because of all times, this is the moment you need to be awake. Not get five more minutes of sleep. It really is time to be awake. Now let's go ahead and face another fact. One of the reasons we are so tired is because we're not getting our way. Because let's go ahead and face the fact that we are spoiled. Because we expected to be spoiled. Because somebody out there said that God will give you anything you want and all you have to do is do everything he says and he'll give you everything you want and people were running around with that in their minds. All of us have come a long way. Maturity is happening to many of us. Spiritual maturity. We're not looking to have our own way. There's a hunger and a thirst for truth. It's in just about all of you. You're driven by an authentic, an authentic motivation to find truth because you've seen the lies. You saw the lies because what you desired to see didn't pan out. Somebody asked me the other day, why are so many Christian relationships broken? Because they were flesh relationships and people tried to make them a Christian relationship. Because the foundation of that relationship is still going to fall within biblical principles. We put ourselves together and try to make God bless it. That's what we did. We put ourselves together and tried to change the other person. That's what we did. And you know that passage where it says when you, I'm going to paraphrase, when you become an adult, you put away childish things. That's exactly what's happening. Because a new season is dawning. See, a day is coming. A brand new day. It's going to be different than any other. It's going to be the longest day of our lives. And everything we've gone through is for a reason. Do you guys know by way of the Bible why you've gone through just about everything? What the Lord has been teaching you to do? He's been teaching you something for a reason. It's that you may have an ability to do something. And I'm wondering how many people have squandered. Because all of us, we didn't know this at first. We didn't. Let's go ahead and face it, we didn't. We took everything lightly, not seriously. We never thought it would turn out this way. Not absolutely. But it did. And it's okay. But the Lord has been having us in trials. Troubles for a reason. I'm going to read some of you guys. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his mind, you, you see, now that's a request. Listen, Ephesians 6.10 starts out by saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. That, that's a pretty powerful statement. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. That, that's authority. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh-oh, he's giving us a hint. Put on the whole armor of God 
Now, when you start reading about the armor and the reasons you go through what you go through is so that they work certain things in your life. They work patience. They work a hope. These troubles and trials and tribulations, they end up making us not ashamed of the Word of God. You know how when you get around your friends in the early days, you would read the Bible and be interested in this fact and that fact, but then your family or your friends would come around you. You didn't even mention the Word of God. You remember that? Or you would somebody would come and you put away your Bible and you try to act like you were not reading it. Those were the days when you were somewhat ashamed of the Word of God. You had little to no confidence in it. Finally, after going through everything you've gone through in life, when your Bible's open and your friends and family come, right, for many of us, we say, well, this is, you get what you get. Well, I thought you were the one that was bad, and yet that was me. And this is me now. You get what you get. This is who I am. A transition is taking place, which means, in the beginning, you put away the Bible so you can keep the standard of those in the world. A time came when you told everybody, yep, I'm the one that messed up and did everything else, but now I follow the Lord. And if they say, well, I don't believe it, you say, well, Jimmy, crack corn. You get what you get. You go through those stages. Why? Because it makes you not ashamed of the word of God. And you have a true desire to stand in righteousness. But hear me, you've gone through trials and tribulations all your life. You better hope you have. All those who have gone through trials and tribulations all their lives, you've gone through tribulation. I hope you know that. The Bible clearly indicates that you're either going to go through tribulation over the duration of your life, or you're going through it all one time when the world is tried. So it's one or the other. By the way, it also worked patience in your life. Remember you had no patience to wait for God, you'd pray for something. You didn't get your answer the next morning, and so instantly you went to go devise a plan to get yourself out of trouble. Anybody ever do that? And then later on, after you mature a little bit, you find out you were going about it the wrong way totally. You don't get yourself out of trouble. You weather the storm by biblical principles, and you see the salvation of the living God. That's a stage many of you are at right now. It does not matter if you're 90 years old. The one thing you did not do was weather the storm, stay on the boat, continue to follow Christ in the middle of the storm, and see his salvation. Do you know what happened to his apostles? They were on a boat and the storm came. Yes, one walked out to go meet the Lord and sunk in the water and it didn't work out too well. But do you know what happened? They kept their eyes upon Christ. Christ delivered the whole boat. You see, they were in a storm one minute. And then all of a sudden they found themselves safely on the opposite side. Do you know that? If you go back and read that, you're going to find out that boat just didn't sail up to the shore. No, it was delivered. It was put there. And nobody knew how they came out of nowhere. Now, how, did you, how did you get here so fast, they said. Because in the Bible, it's almost like they were teleported. But the point here is this. While a lot of people focus on that, and in, in my opinion, that would be a common thing. The Lord can do what he so chooses. But the point of that scripture is that that storm they were going through was purposed. And it was teaching a great many things. And it was a time where Peter could finally see who he was in truth. Peter did not know who he was in truth because what did he say? He said, Lord, if you tell me to walk out there, I'll do it. So the Lord said, walk out here. Then. See, at first he thought he was going to do it, didn't he? He really thought he was going to do it. And I know you've heard this story a thousand different ways, but let me tell you something here. He thought he could walk on that water. If Christ said and called him, he thought, yep, that's all I need. I can walk on that water out there. But what happened? He walked out there and he started sinking, didn't he? So he thought one thing in the beginning, and he ended up well below his own standard. What did he find out? He found out the truth of himself. Was it a bad thing? No, it was not. It was useful. Because if that had not happened, he would have continued to believe that he could do anything and that somehow he would maintain. So what does it tell you? You can think that you can do something, but you must have experience. Do you hear me? You must have experience or you're going to what? Doubt. You must have experience or you're going to doubt. Do you hear me? You're just not going to walk off the boat and go straight to Jesus without experience because you're going to think of every negative thing. And if you have no experience with the deliverance of the Messiah, you're going to say in your lives, troubles have come. Many of you have dodged the trouble. You did not weather the storm. You did everything you could do to get out of that trouble. That's where your whole focus was. You refused to listen to anything else. 
and you didn't experience the deliverance of Christ. See, had you weathered that storm and said, I'm going to do this by biblical principles and values. I don't care who hates me. I don't care if I lose everything. I'm going to do it by the word of God. Had you done that, you would have been delivered by Christ. No one else could take credit. And you would have confidence right now, regardless of what the trial is. You would say, nope, the Lord will deliver me. I already know it. And then if the Lord ever called you to go walk on some water, you'd say, here I come. I'm on my way. Why? Because you know his delivering power. Many of you are missing his delivering power. Do you know that you're missing the experience of his deliverance? Now, what is that for? Is experience necessary? You better believe it. If the Messiah said it was necessary, then it's necessary. And why? Why is it necessary? Because once you have experience with God's deliverance through Christ, doubt does not enter in. How many of you struggle with doubt? It's okay if you do. Doubted Thomas, he did the same thing, didn't he? But he doubted a different way. He doubted the absolute resolve of Christ, yet Christ loved him. But how many of you, in all honesty, doubt creeps into you too often? You love the Lord, you want to follow everything he says. But listen to me, this is sincere. You still cannot trust the entire process of the living God through Christ. It's okay. Everybody's been there. You hear me? Everybody's been there. You don't have to act like you trust the Lord 100% in this setting, at least. This is about the real gospel. Now, this isn't the phony baloney stuff. I hate to say it that way, but I'm not trying to act like we have perfected everything in the gospel. Nothing gets solved when everybody acts like they're perfect. We know about our own imperfections, shortcomings, and everything else. And we know that we have issues with doubt. We know that. How do you break that? Listen to me. Your father stands ready to put you in his process immediately. That means you haven't lost your chance. Of all the things in the word of God, there's a promise that has never failed in your life. Does anybody know what that promise is? The promise of you going through trials and tribulations. Many people miss that. Trials and tribulations are incredibly, incredibly important. Without them, we're going to be missing a valuable tool set. And without that tool set, we can't withstand the wiles of the devil. I'm going to take you back to Ephesians 6. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, for we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins good about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked, all fiery darts. Fiery darts burn. A burn will make you make noises. Fiery darts hurt. Not only do they penetrate, but they burn like those deep hurts you have had in your life that absolutely has caused some of you to become incredibly bitter. That was a fiery dart and it burned and it prospered because you didn't have the armor in that location. Now God will never allow Satan to fire darts at you all the time. You're going to get the first one so you know what the fiery dart is. But he desires you to have the armor that nothing can do you like that again. There's still many of you who are bitter in certain areas of your life. You don't share it with anybody. But there's still bitterness there. It's still a guarded region of your listening. If you're guarding anything of you, you don't have the armor in that area. Because the last time I checked, if you wear the armor of the living God, you need not guard anything. But if you're guarding something, uh-oh, you're missing some armor. And that means what you're doing is walking around protecting an area of yourself is what you're doing. You're walking funny. Can you imagine a person walking down the street is protecting his stomach? He's humped over protecting his stomach. How can he get anything done if he's constantly afraid that somebody's going to injure his stomach? He's humped over. He looks odd. He's walking down the street. He can't do anything because he's constantly guarding his stomach. Some of you are doing that with something in your life. God didn't design us to walk like that. 
But then if we have his armor, you're not protecting anything because the armor protects you, correct? You only have to protect yourself when the armor is not on you. Uh-oh. See, we got a problem, don't we? Because if you're protecting yourself, then your armor, the armor of the living God that you're supposed to be wearing, you got Kmart counterfeit armor, and it's not working out too well. Because when you have God's armor on, you don't walk around protecting yourself. Because you know the armor protects you. If I was in an M1 tank, I'm not going to worry about 5.56 millimeter flyer because I'm, I'm, I got armor all around me. But if I'm on my feet walking in the middle of nowhere, when I hear small arms fire, I'm going to hit the ground because there's no armor. And any vulnerable point can get hit. And when that happens, I can be done for. Like your heart. When you're in the world doing what you do, your heart is a vulnerable place. You get hit in your heart, it can collapse you to your knees. What part of the armor protects your heart? Does anybody know? Righteousness protects your heart. That's why it's a breastplate of righteousness. It protects your heart. If you are standing in righteousness and somebody attempts to hurt you because you're standing in righteousness, they can withdraw everything of themselves from you. And I'm telling you right now, if you're standing in righteousness, it's not going to be perceived as pain. Do you know why? Because to stand in righteousness is to be conformed to the word of the Lord. And if you're conformed to the word of the Lord, then you love your neighbor and your enemy as yourself. And if you do that, you're not looking for them to love you. You're looking to love them. That means you care about them. So if the event comes where they ever have to walk away, you still love them. That love cannot be broken. You're still looking out for them. Even It doesn't matter what they do. You're still going to look out for them. Do you hear me? That's actual love. That's just what God did with us because we walked away from the living God, but he still loved us in that he sent his only begotten son, didn't he, to die for us. We didn't, upon learning about Christ, upon knowing about Christ, we didn't do everything right. We tested, poked and prodded to see if it were real or not, to see what would happen. And then all of a sudden, eventually, we came to his son. But the Lord had loved us long before that, and he kept the standard so that we could later on come to his son. Do you see how that works? That's how love works. In the Bible it says God commanded his love towards us. That's exactly what love does. Love will say, I'm going to love that person no matter what. Doesn't matter what they do to me. I will always depart good to them. Good does not mean flowers all the time. Do you see that? You cannot hurt the heart of anybody who loves you. You can't. Because true love expects no love. True love is there to give it regardless if the other person receives it or not. It is always pouring out love. People don't understand that because all they know is earthly love. Because so many people are looking to be loved. They can't have the spiritual definition of love and they can't comprehend it. Because they've already been hit before they ever had any armor. Because they're already broken. And you cannot know the truth in a broken state. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord said, When, the, when you have a wound, the whole head is sick. You know what that means? If you have a wound and God said it should have been healed. But because it's not healed, the whole head is sick. That means everything you comprehend is going to be laden with the pain in that area. That's what it means. That means what you take in is always going to be tainted with pain. That means if you read the word, it's going to be tainted with pain. If you read the word tainted with pain, the only message you're going to have for anybody else is to protect yourself. Run from the monsters. Run from this. Run from that. God does not teach you how to run. God says, stand. Having done all you can do to stand, stand, therefore. Do you see that? He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you, not run from him. Resist him. You know what? To resist the devil is not to agree with him. That's how you resist him. Because if you're not resisting him, guess what you're doing? You're embracing him. Wouldn't that be the opposite of resist? Embrace? Of course it would be. You electronic people, resistance. The opposite of resistance is what? To conduct. To embrace, to take in, resist the devil. That's when you stand firm and you're not yielding left or right. But in order to stand like that, you have to stand on truth, on good ground. The Lord has been teaching this all our lives. These trials, this crucible of life, can depart through beauty to a person. Only if your comprehension is bound in righteousness. That's why you shouldn't curse your past. When it's all said and done, it'd be as though nothing has ever happened to you in the first place. Most people make a mistake and they don't realize what happens to them only happens to the flesh. But nothing has touched you personally. Nothing has stained you. Nothing has touched you. No one has taken anything away from you. 
Isn't that what Jesus said? You cannot lose anything on this earth that you will not gain back in heaven sevenfold. Isn't that true? You can't even lose anything. Why is he, why does he talk like that? Some people think they're going to get to heaven and have memory of everything they lost. No, you won't. Even in the Bible it says, all your memories of evil at a specific point of evil and darkness and all that stuff's going to be wiped away. You'll not have it anymore. You'll have no memory of anybody who didn't make it. So you're not going to sit up there sad because your best buddy didn't make it in. You're going to be in the realm of truth. And when you're in the realm of truth, you're not going to feel sad for a demon. Because those who did not make it, as it turns out, Christ never knew them, which means they did not come from your father. Now, you don't know who's who here on this earth. Because God said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. And at the end, the angels will harvest. And then people will know who is who. You're not going to know who is who right now. Because in order to learn to love, you have to have your enemy near. Only when you truly love your enemy, do you actually start loving anybody at all. Do you know that? Loving someone who loves you back is not love at all. Even Jesus said the publicans do that. Earthly fathers do that. No, when you love your enemy, now you're exercising love. Oh, and by the way, only God can define love, not mankind and its philosophers. So you know that. Someone says, Michael, of course, are we supposed to put our armor on every day or put it on and leave it on? You are never to take that armor off. If you take the armor off, you just got out from under. Everything that permits you to walk in darkness and not be touched. All of you know what it's like to walk without armor. That was back in your days of youth when people abused you. When some of you were raped and beaten. You know what it's like to walk this earth without armor. You have no protection and no voice to intercede. When you have the armor, you're an impenetrable fortress that is useful on this earth. So once you put that armor on, it stays on. To take the armor off means you no longer believe. To take the armor off means you're no longer in righteousness. Do you see that? To take the armor off means you no longer carry the gospel of peace. To take the armor off means you no longer operate by truth. You're never to take the armor off. And the armor is you don't put all the armor on all at one time either. You get the armor as you enter through trials and tribulations or else you don't get the armor at all because only by trials and tribulations are we proven wrong and the truth avails in our lives and once the truth avails that's when we accept it and we say i want that truth and not my own lie and as you do that you dawn elements of the armor on piece by piece by piece by piece it takes trials and tribulations to get that. That means you get the armor over the course of your life. You don't get it all at one time. You don't. How many times have we had weak faith? How many times? All of us have had weak faith at some point or another. And what that means, if you have weak faith, then the shield was not there. And the fiery darts of the enemy penetrated us. Well, you don't have the shield of faith. The darts, those fiery darts of the enemy will get to you. When you got an attitude, when you were angry at somebody, when you wanted to hurt somebody because they hurt you, you were hit by fiery dark. When your heart was broken by somebody in the world that doesn't even love the Lord, you had, you were hit by fiery dark. That happens over time. You get these elements over time. You know when the Bible says the Lord is the author and finisher of your faith? Well, guess what? If he is the author of it, then it began with him giving it to you so that you could be kept, but it was not fully developed. You have to learn to use the full measure of faith. So over time, your shield got bigger and bigger. And as your shield gets bigger, you're able to do what? To ward off many more darts. That means through life, less and less things actually get to you. Haven't you noticed that? As you have gone through trouble after trouble after trouble in this world, the things that used to break you down don't even phase you right now. That's evidence of your shield of faith and what it's doing. Because the fiery darts of the enemy can't penetrate like they used to. That happens over time. So you start out with this little tiny shield that looks more like a ring. And although your finger is protected, nothing else is. And as it grows, it covers a greater and greater area until it becomes a shield that can guard the entirety of you from the fiery darts of the enemy. That's, that's what the shield is for, for the fiery darts of the enemy. Many of you have had broken hearts, haven't you? And it's because you did not understand nor did you have comprehension of all righteousness. See, with the armor, that breastplate of righteousness, what is it guarding? 
It's why it's called a breastplate. Those are vital organs. Your heart and your lungs, they go hand in hand, do they not? Yes. So guess what? That breastplate begins as a medallion. It's quite tiny. It doesn't guard too much, but at least it grows. And as you have more and more experiences with the living God, and that breastplate gets bigger and bigger as part of the armor of God. Guess what happens? Your heart is less and less broken. Isn't that amazing? When you were tiny, somebody could say, hey, I don't like your shoes, and you would cry. Heartbroken because somebody didn't like your shoes. You had a lot of surprises in life, and things that used to get to you, they don't even phase you now, do they? It's not that people stopped curling these things at you. It's that they are of no effect right now. They say the exact same things, they look the exact same ways, they do the exact same things, but they are of no effect to you. Why? Because that breastplate of armor is doing its job. That breastplate of righteousness is doing its job. So as you continue to go through your trials, you're learning righteousness. Because only in a trial do we actually throw down our ego and pride. And we say, Lord, I messed it all up. See, before your trial, you were saying everybody else messed it up. It's their fault. Surely it wasn't my fault. I thought I got away with it, right? When your trial takes its toll, you say, forgive me, Lord. I messed it all up. And that's when righteousness comes in. You see that? Righteousness will never come in so long as we deny the evident things in our lives. So let's go ahead and face it. Before that breastplate got pretty big to guard our hearts and truth, what were we saying? No, oh, no, it wasn't me. It was them. They're the reason this happened. Oh, no, it wasn't my fault. It was their fault. But in the middle of those heavy trials, what did you end up doing? You said, Lord, I did all of this. My pride, stupidness. I'm just so stupid. How can you forgive me? That's what you end up saying. You begin to see and confess exactly who you are and what you've done. And in that moment, righteousness comes in and a healing takes place. Now, you may not have noticed, but did you remember that when you confessed that, a healing came of the heart? Did you notice? And all that comes after. Our pride and ego and all that stuff is broken down. Those are heavy trials and tribulations. That's what they're for. They break the pride of us. Get us into the realm of truth. We begin to confess that truth. We ask for forgiveness. We indeed repent because now we acknowledge what we have done. And the Lord is just to forgive. And that breastplate of righteousness expands. All of a sudden, you're not heartbroken. You're thankful. You never take that off. All your armor has been growing piece by piece by piece by piece as you have been living your life. More specifically, as you go through things in this life, more and more has been added to you. Until one day, you're totally covered by the armor of the living God. Not your armor, the armor of God. And nothing can penetrate the armor of God because it's not your armor. It's his armor that you're wearing. That means Satan can't do anything with that. That's almost a communication to you that once you get to this phase, I am covering you and nothing will get through me. The Lord's been doing this all of your life. Can you see it? All of your life he's been doing this. You know, in the book of Job, it says one of the friends came to Job and said, God will put man in a deep sleep to get him to go beyond his pride and his ego and all that stuff so he can seal instructions inside of him. God will do that. In a deep sleep, man is not prideful and full of his own ideas and everything else. That's when God seals knowledge within a person or instruction within a person. That's in the book of Job. It's fascinating because only in that deep sleep are you not thinking about your own personal plans and how much you matter to everybody else and how right you are above everybody else and your opinions of this and the other. So that we know that God gets, he gets us beyond our own pride and ego. This happens in life over time, not all at once, over time. Now all of you who said you were tired, look at your life again. There is no way you have a trouble in this world and it not be a trial or tribulation. And if that is the case, God has been working with you for a long time. And if you see it by the eyes of truth, there's no way you can be tired. I don't subscribe to what everybody else says. I'm not an everybody else person. Well, that's what everybody says. You won't hear that from me. Not in my personal life. Not my. If I were to talk when I'm sleeping, you still wouldn't hear. You're certainly not going to hear it now. I'm tired. Because the person that says I'm tired, what they're actually starting to admit is I'm tired of trying to make everything my way. If I get tired of something, it's because my way did not work. 
then what I'm really saying is I keep trying to make this happen and make this happen and it's not happening and I'm getting tired because I'm not getting my way. Think about it. Because if you know God is doing everything, how can we get tired? If the Lord's will is doing everything. Because to say you're tired then means you're rejecting of his will. You don't want to mess around with it. You know, I don't feel like fooling with the Lord's will today. I wish he wouldn't do it. Think about it. We get tired because our way failed. We get tired because the stuff we tried to do failed. We get tired because we get mentally worn out from trying to make something happen. We get tired because we're still trying to do things the way we think is righteousness when all we have to do is yield and agree with the will of God and He will do the work. What are we doing doing all the work? Never once, never once did God ever call us and say, listen children, I'm going to give you this uh, pitchfork. Now it's going to be hard work. He did not say that. He said, take up your cross and follow me. He never said, get your shovel, your pickaxe. Get all that stuff. We're going to do some digging. That's not what he said. We do that with our plans. We did that in our lives, trying to make this person and this person what we want them to be, trying to make this happen and that happen. And when it didn't happen, the first thing we say, I'm tired. Why are you tired? Well, because I'm trying to get this person to change and they won't do it. Well, quit trying to do that. The Lord didn't call us to change anybody. He didn't call us to make people hear the gospel. He did not call us for those things. A person gets tired because Satan is opposing them and nothing, nothing they do is work. What did the Lord say? But see, that's contrary to what the living God said, isn't it? If God said, I'll give you rest, what are, people, what are God's children doing tired? If he said, we'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding, how in the world? Why do we have the condition we have? I'll tell you why. Because many people follow theory and not the truth. In order to have the truth, you've got to go through something. And if you're over the age of 50, you've gone through something. Why reject what the Lord has distilled in you? Why are we so stubborn that after all the trials and tribulations, we still think we're right? I'll be the first to tell you guys, I do not want to be the one that's right. Don't sit there and say, Mike was right. Forget about that. I don't want to be the right one. That's a plague of humanity. Everybody's trying to be right. They're so self-absorbed in trying to be right that they're exerting energy in things that mean nothing. I don't need to be right. I serve a father who's always right. So I don't need to be right. I just need to follow him. That's wasted energy trying to be right. We know he's the only thing right left in a wrong world. We know that. Not us. He is. we got to be careful in these days because all these things we're discussing can so easily be lost. We could so easily be beset, put right back in square one, and not even know how we got there. Press in. Some of you that have not opened your Bibles in a couple weeks, open it. That's about your family. You know that, don't you? Some of you who are so lonely and you're just mad because you don't have anybody in your life and this and the other, do you really understand that what the Lord has for you can never be tainted here on this earth? That your endeavors here are soon to be open. That every single last one of us going through that transition phase. And that tomorrow's not promised to any of us, I'll tell you what. People keep asking me, I don't know how you do it day in and day out and still have that same enthusiasm and that same this and that same that. And we can see you're tired and yet you still go forward. How do you do that? You really want to know? Here it is. I know that I'm leaving this earth. Every day I have a thought. Lord, if I have to go today, did I do everything I'm supposed to do? Does everybody have, because I can't come back and do anything. And what I start doing is I start going throughout the day making sure that I've left nothing undone. Do you know my day starts with repentance, not of unknown things, because why would I repent of something I don't even know about? No, the Lord lets us know what we need to repent of. So I spend my time thinking of those things that I know about and I analyze them. See, because I don't want to do anything that's going to cause me to be the biggest hypocrite on the planet become powerless, always advocating Christ, yet never receiving of the Lord. I'm not going to be one of those people. My day starts with repentance and thanks. But I'm, I'm also mindful that this could be my real last day. This could be your last moment on earth. No more tomorrows. That's it. The story is ended. All your plans out of the window. You will leave this earth just as sure as you were born. You will leave this earth one way or the other. And you don't know when, but the question is, how many of you are not even thinking about that? And you have nothing ready for your departure. 
You've left nothing for anybody else. What about somebody who comes into your dwelling? What about um, uh, somebody who may read what you've been going through? Somebody that picks up your Bible and may look at the notes. Are you truly believing in the Word of God enough to know that one day you're going to die in the flesh? That's a transition to us. No one is promised tomorrow. So how can a person sit there day in and day out and say, I have nothing to do? They sit there day in and day out and say, oh, things are just so bad. You're leaving. You will leave. Do you know what gives a person motivation when they're in a race? It's when they see the finish line. It doesn't matter what shape their body's in. It doesn't matter. When they see that finish line, they know it's about to be over. And often, that is just enough to keep them going to the finish line. Do you not realize that you're close to your finish line? You will lead and only what you have done for the Lord and true. Those things of eternity will last. And how many people are going to leave their children holding the bag? How many people are going to leave their loved ones holding the bag? How many people didn't take their time to prepare for the truth of their own life? Who's going to come into your house and go through all your stuff and find out all your little dirty secrets? See, some people need to do, uh, they need to clean some stuff up. How many of you thought you wouldn't make it to this day? You thought a situation or a time was going to take you. You thought you'd be dead by now, but you're not. You're right here. And the question is, how did you get through that time? You can document it now. Do it in truth. Don't embellish it. Be blunt. Try not to use the big words, but be as simple as possible, understanding that, uh, that they, they, you know this world can be war-torn at a certain time. You can be of great use to people. See, some of you who are good in music, that's why the Lord didn't have you make it in the secular realm. Suppose you wrote a song, and people loved the song you were, you were hit. But long after you're gone, that song is going to keep playing, and it will continue to corrupt people. What a thought. But after you pass this world, your song can be corrupting people long after you're gone. That would be horrible, wouldn't it? And some of you, the Lord was going to have you over to the world to be lost that way. You make a song, it endures. And that song will affect people so long as they play it. That makes the condemned really condemned. Many of you have talents and gifts, but the Lord said, no, I'm not going to lose you to the world. Because if the Lord would have allowed you to become prosperous in those areas in the world, you would have been lost to the kingdom of truth. You would have been lost to righteousness. You would have cursed your own life. And long after you were dead, you would continue to curse other people. The Lord wasn't going to have you do that. Some of these music artists out there who wrote the raunchiest things and their songs still play today. And people worship the devil through their music. I don't even want to know what's happening with them. They're not here on this earth, but what they did is causing people to reject Jesus. Can you imagine? The Lord didn't want you in that position. He knows exactly what he's doing. Having said all that, there's so much you can do for somebody else. Some of these babies that are around here. It could be some of those babies who read the exact thing you leave. Many people will need encouragement during that time. They won't be clear on what actually happened. It, it, can you imagine if somebody would have wrote with prophecy if they would have told us what they were dealing with at that very moment and why they thought the way they thought? Because I know in my writings, I tell people, I don't want to interpret anything for you. You see what you see. But back in, I'll always give them a comparison of what our time was like, what was happening at that very moment, what everybody thought prophecy was. How will people know they live in the time of the beast if they're born in the time of the beast how would they ever identify the beast how could they ever break free of the beast these are times before he's taken that stage in full before he has that what that single entity has walked up to the stage although i hope you guys understand something about america i don't want to tell you but it's going to come out anyway now i'm not talking about theory or anything else i'm talking about truth the monthly dedications that happen in this nation that america it surely is the head of something I want you to know that. Why do you think in our White House we have representatives of every country? While everybody's looking at the United Nations, they forgot to look in Congress and the Senate. Lord help us. But that's another story, a different story. They know what they did and they know what they founded things on. Any any of you know about that statue the, of the hand raising out of the ground? Anybody know that? Anybody familiar with that? It's a giant arm coming out of the ground. Anybody ever see that before? It's the reason that hand is coming out of the ground like that. It's a giant hand, too. It's a reason for that. But that's a midnight hour thing. That's for a sober... That's for 
mature audiences only. Why? Because it, it, it tells of something that's happening here. Nobody is removing any of the things. Nobody's removing it, which lets you know uh, they're highly complicit with it. In fact, it is, in fact, the, the doctrine we follow. And sadly, it really is the doctrine we follow. But I'm going to share that with you guys at a midnight hour. The mysteries need to come out. They do. You guys know that uh, Paul is the son of Dagon, right? Not Dagon, Dagon, the god of corn. Baal is the son of the god of corn. Do you guys know that? The god of corn, or Dagon, which they later called Dagon. The god of corn was an entity that they used to worship because he could give instruction on how to make crops grow. You ever heard of the fall of the Nephilim? That's what they were worshiping. Worshiping demons as gods. So listen to me carefully. To depict Baal was to always have a crown with corn on the left and right side of the crown. Corn is in the crown. If you ever see that, now you know who that bearded person is. Keep in mind, the presidents of the U.S. did not have a crown with corn in it. That's Baal. That's who that is. The so you guys know. You know, Baal was once killed and taken to the underworld, but was later awakened. So if anybody ever goes to Haynes Point, Washington, D.C., that's where that hand is coming out of the ground, it says something on it. Something disturbing. Something that's rededicated every day. Every week, actually. It is dedicated every week. Ceremony once a month, right here in this nation. And it's not something new. And the statue's dominance, and all the iconography, and the inscription and the stories, even the seal. The Hebrew decree was an anti-decree in Hebrew, cursing the Hebrews. It's all here in one little place. Do you know that? All of it is. It's in plain sight, but you have to know to know. If you don't know, you won't know. If you don't know about the corn, you just simply won't know. If you know about the corn, you will know. That statue, by the way, is called the Awakening. Do you know what it's called when you raise somebody from the underworld? The Awakening. Oops, and that's on the statue. Well, I thought I'd give you guys that random fact. We have a lot to discuss in that area. Well, for those who want to know. Why do I mention that? Because a seat has been established. A seat all of you will eventually know about. A seat has been established and something has been planned out very well. Would you guys be curious to know what you see in the Middle East is the beginning of something. The beginning of a situation nobody is, is actually speaking about, coming about. This situation is the beginning of something. It within itself is not the situation, but it is the beginning of the undoing. And you guys, if you're alive right now and seeing it, you're in the time right now. So if you're asking for timing, you're in the time right now. You're in the exact season at the exact time. There have been historical figures who made a blueprint to most of what has happened in the world. And according to that blueprint they made, everything has taken place, just as it was given. It is an amazing thing how persistent evil can be to bring about the rule of their God. They will resurface again, and they're preparing all the seats for that. I'll say that again. There are large organizations of people preparing to bring their deity back, just as you guys look for Christ. You look for him, and no one was given the day nor the hour. They were given a task to perform a few dozen things, and then when it was accomplished, they would have prepared properly the seat of him that will walk through the door, of that thing that will walk through the door. He will not walk through the door until it's complete, and when it's complete, he's coming through that door. Part of what's about to happen to America and Europe and France Europe, I'm praying for you guys. Italy, I'm praying for you guys. The UK, I'm really praying for you guys. The people, I am praying for the people. I'm praying for the people because the people are not aware. They've been educated to believe that that's the world they live in, not knowing that everything around them is a construct. Everything is. Even to the financial system. A plan was laid out for the financial system. The financial system is a ruse. If you look at the financial system in a real context, you have to have money to operate, right? But to them, it is something they created to bring about something else. It's a control mechanism. Keeps the prisoners happy. Keeps the system believable. So long as you have to struggle, your heart's going to be in it. So long as you're given someone to struggle for, your soul is going to be tied to it. They already know this. Some of the most advanced behavioral scientists that ever have been and philosophers. 
They've gotten together and made a roadmap, a roadmap that's been followed to this very day. And all leaders have been complicit with the plan. That we'll discuss also. And that's for you guys here at COT, so you'll have some clarity. Because there's no way we can talk about any of that unless you guys have a foundation on what these guys have developed over time. Time for you to see the world in its true sense. Finances is something that they have given to mankind as a way to fulfill certain desires, certain needs, and so on and so forth. But they control that. They give the populace what they feel the populace should have. They cause the populace to compete. Competition is very important because it breeds violence. Violence brings about death or sacrifice. That death or sacrifice creates a doorway for darkness itself. Right now they're busy stirring up the Islamic world. I hope you know that. I'll say it again. The entire Islamic world is being stirred. That's why you should keep your mind on the populace. Not those who are wielding the weapons and doing the evil things, but on the populace. Intercede for them, for those who are the innocent bystanders of somebody else's plan. But be careful of the sides you take in this world, because you have no idea what you're joining yourself to. Don't assume that you know someone is good or bad. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Allow the Lord to reveal that truth to all of you. But be careful. Do you not know that in this world the worst people have the best merits among men? Listen to me. Please hear me on this. If the world embraces something, do you really believe it's godly? Please be careful. You're in the middle of a vast kingdom you can't see. And no matter what side you take, you're playing their game. And no one is going to be victorious in the game they're playing. And they're playing for keeps. Please keep that in mind. The Bible gives a consequence to the iniquity of men. If this is a real plan, it is highly iniquitous, is it not? Based on the iniquity of men, so will the earth respond with natural disasters. In this case, if it's real iniquitous, the responses will be of devastating magnitude. Now you know what to watch for. God always foreshadows a warning. He will always tell of a warning, then it will come physically. That means a foreshadowing of several different things. And then the big ones come. I believe the foreshadowings are taking place now. Keep your eyes open to it. In the book of Isaiah, the earth was cursed because of the, of the iniquity of men, which means the earth will respond to the darkness of men and their plans. Take note of what the earth is doing. It's only a foreshadowing. Take note of what it's done. It too is a foreshadowing. It was by no means the real event, because the real events, instead of 20,000, we're going to see 200,000 gone. The populace of this earth will diminish rapidly. Rapidly. That means a whole lot of people are going to transition because of natural disasters in terrible ways. Please take note of that. And don't get in the habit of running from it. Be watchful for it. Understand how it works together by the Bible and God's principles. Not by theory, but by God's principles. The earth is cursed because the iniquity of the earth is great. So it's directly proportional to the iniquity of man. And if they're planning something highly iniquitous, you better believe the earth is going to respond. And the next number we're going to see is 200,000 dead. And even that will only be a foreshadowing. At the beginning of the conversation, I asked you guys something to look at the whole picture, not half the picture. In your respective areas, you may have peace, a little bit of serenity. Look at the whole world. You have the tools set to do it. Look at the whole world. Look at everything. More specifically, look at the children of every land. If you want to know the condition of any nation, look at the children of that land. Know their stories, and you'll find the condition of that place. Look at the poor of that land. Know the condition of the poor, and you will know the condition of that nation. Now, those are biblical principles. That means you can't look at the rich and see the state of a country. You can't do that. You have to look at the poor, and you have to look at the children. And then you'll know the state of that land. Some of us says, Michael, do you think that things are going to speed up faster and faster? In comparison to what we're about to go through, nothing has happened yet. Is that good enough? Right now, today, is as though we've gone through nothing. You can include World War I and II and all the conflicts in between, and still it's like we've gone through nothing compared to what's coming. A time of hopelessness is coming. A time we were warned about. A time that the Lord Jesus told us to be ready for. 
He's the one that told us not to toy with our salvation, but to work it out with fear and trembling. He told us that. We're the ones that give ourselves an excuse to relax, to forget about everything because we we refuse to remain vigilant behind righteousness. Take note that you're ambassadors of a kingdom that is untainted. You're in this world, not of this world. And you'll start to see some heavy calamities. In America, New York is a ticking time bomb, just so you guys understand that. Washington, D.C. is going to be target number one. Displacement of the populace in many different places, especially cities, is going to become a, an unfortunate thing. People will be stuck in the cities. Those times are coming. Evil is collaborating. Even tonight, even right now, evil is collaborating. Look at the whole picture, the whole thing. Remember the children. Remember the poor. In the Bible, we're told to look at them because they're basically at the mercy of the place they're in. And by that mercy, you'll know the condition of that place and what's about to befall them. Those of you in the UK and in Germany and in France and in Italy, I'm praying for you guys. A heaviness is coming right to you here in America. A real separation is about to take place. In all cases, none of it could happen unless the Lord allowed it. And if the Lord does allow it, if it does take place, you better believe you're in the middle of the greatest transition in human history. Now is the time to have resolve in your life. Not to declare anything, but simply do it. Don't declare you're standing in righteousness. Just simply stand in righteousness. Don't declare the acceptable day of the Lord. Stand in righteousness. That all the days you enter into reflect those days of the Most High and His standards. Now is a good time to love your enemies. Don't point a finger nor scoff at somebody else's calamity. For the Lord will put you in their shoes. See, anybody who scoffs, God said he will give them direct understanding of that situation by having them go through the same thing. If you scoff at somebody's calamity, the Lord gave a warning that we ought to keep our mouths shut during those times. If your enemy falls, do not scoff your enemy, lest you find yourself go through the same thing. It means the Lord is working. So more and more every day, my encouragement is for you all to stand in truth. Don't disregard your past. Be thankful you were delivered from it. See what the Lord was doing. Stand in your position. Upright. Trusting. 